So we're going to start now, and for the rest of the neuro section, we're going to do some unknown cases. So the first case is a 50-year-old male with new left-sided meiosis and ptosis. So you have a non-contrast CT, and initially this patient only had a non-contrast CT and a contrast-enhanced CT. But based on the history, the patient uh, needs something else. So what other exam would you order? You can see the finding on the contrast-enhanced CT, but very subtle. So here's the patient's CTA. It's the same patient. This is the patient's MR. So the next patient is a 77-year-old with acute left-sided weakness. So the next patient is a 39-year-old male who comes in with seizures. And this is a non-contrast CT. So the differential here, you've got multiple calcified lesions on CT. And this is the MRI in the same patient. Axial T2 sequence is in a coronal gradient. Next patient is a 15-year-old who comes in with a headache and right homominous hemianopsia. And here's the CT angio in that patient and the conventional angiogram. Here's a 40-year-old female pre-op. So what vessel is being injected? What procedure do you think is being done? So this is a 70-year-old female with acute onset of headache. So what are the key findings here, and what study do you want to do next? Here's that patient's CTA and conventional angiogram. So this is the seventh unknown case, the two different patients with the same diagnosis, one patient with the MRI and the second patient um, with a conventional angiogram. So the 77-year-old that comes in with multiple cranial nerve palsies, third, fourth, and sixth. So this is a 56-year-old with a headache and word-finding difficulty. So this is a non-contrast CT. And this is the MRI in that patient. And this is a diagnosis that's often overlooked and often not thought about. Here's the MRV in that patient and the ADC map. Here's a four-year-old with progressive loss of milestones similar to a case that Dr. Glenn showed earlier. Post-contrast, T1-weighted, and an axial T2. And this is the MR angiogram in that same patient. And the last unknown case, this is a 52-year-old with proptosis and vision loss. And this is the conventional angiogram in that same patient. Okay, so as many of you may have guessed, we're looking at vascular unknowns today. Since we didn't have a vascular session, we're going to review some of the vascular pathology that you may see on the boards now. So the first case, the key here is really the history. So this patient came in with this exact history of left meiosis and ptosis. So this patient has a Horner syndrome and had a non-contrast CT and only a post-contrast CT. So very subtle finding on the post-contrast, but if you look at the cervical carotid, and that's where you should be looking when you see this history, you can see that there is a filling defect in the carotid there. And of course, on the CT angiogram, you can see the normal caliber cervical carotid on the right, and on the left, you can see a markedly narrowed caliber. This sequence 
is an axial T1 fat saturated sequence, which is a sequence that you should suggest when you're concerned about dissection. And what we're looking at, this crescentic high intensity around the lumen, is met hemoglobin in a mural, intramural hematoma. This is the patient's MRA. And you can see the cutoff of the internal carotid artery there just beyond the bifurcation. So an unusual site for atherosclerosis. And some other anatomy. Here's your common carotid, your external carotid, your subclavian artery, and your vertebral artery. So ICA dissection, they can present with neck pain and bolic events. They can also present with watershed ischemia, Horner syndrome, and even cranial nerve 12 palsy. You can evaluate with CTA or MRA. Remember if you do an MRI to include the fat saturated sequence. These can be spontaneous or post-traumatic, the common location. So if it's spontaneous, it's usually several centimeters above the bifurcation, unlike atherosclerosis that you normally see at the bifurcation. For traumatic pseudoaneurysms, you can see pseudoaneurysms in the distal cervical carotid and often at the skull base from fractures through the carotid canal. And then finally, the vertebral artery, look up at C1, C2. So when should you suggest dissection? Well, really, whenever you see irregularity in sites that are unusual for atherosclerosis, because dissection can present as a string sign, so it can present as luminal narrowing, it can present as aneurysmal dilatation, it can present as occlusion or even intimal flap. And here you can say, see a case of dissection with pseudoaneurysm in the cervical carotid. This is post-traumatic, and this is post-coiling. So this is the second unknown case, a 77-year-old with acute left-sided weakness. So an intraparenchymal hematoma, a lobar hematoma, and a 77-year-old. So one of the top things you should be thinking of is, of is amyloid angiopathy. And that's exactly what you see here, multiple areas of susceptibility on this gradient sequence. A big differential is hypertensive hemorrhage, even though hypertensive hemorrhage, as we'll discuss, is more common in the basal ganglia, the pons, and the cerebellum. Five to 15% can present as lobar hemorrhages. When you're trying to differentiate on a gradient sequence, hypertensive hemorrhage is more commonly going to have areas of microbleeds in the basal ganglia, whereas amyloid is going to be low bar. And of course, you also want to consider underlying mass lesions, underlying vascular malformations, and even dural sinus thrombosis. So amyloid angiopathy, 15% of low bar hemorrhages over 60, but you can see when patients are over 70, up to 50% of low bar hemorrhages are going to be amyloid angiopathy. And here's just an H&E stain demonstrating the mural inf infiltration of the beta amyloid. So your differential diagnosis for non-traumatic intraparenchymal hemorrhage, know this one. So underlying lesions, so you can look for tumor, solid enhancement, AVM, cavernoma. On a CTA, you look for the developmental venous anomaly. And aneurysm, remember that aneurysm, you can see parenchymal hemorrhages from aneurysm amyloid, dural sinus thrombosis, and of course hypertension, and these are the classic locations, and, and underlying coagulopathy. So here's an example of a hypertensive hemorrhage in a classic location here in the putamen. But remember again that 5 to 15% can be low bar. You'll see two patterns. One is this acute focal hematoma, but you can also see these subacute chronic microbleeds on the gradient sequence. So if you see a hematoma, the gradient sequence can be a hint to the underlying etiology of the acute hematoma. And remember to look for active extravasation on CTA in your post contrast. And here's this patient's gradient sequence, multiple areas of microbleeds and susceptibility centered in the basal ganglia. So the next unknown case is a 39-year-old male with seizures. And so here the differential on CT is for multiple calcified lesions. You can see in the right cerebral peduncle, in the right temporal lobe, and the left frontal lobe. So what is the differential for multiple calcifications? So you can think of multiple cavernomas. Neurosister psychosis, the calcification is usually smaller, more round, punctate, not this large, uh, irregular calcification. Also prior infection that we saw, treated TB, treated toxo, as we saw in the infection talk. And here's the MRI, and now you're seeing the more classical features for cavernoma. You can see this complete hemosiderin ring and the T2 hyperintensity centrally from different uh, ages of hemorrhage. And you can again see this one in the pons and the multiple areas of susceptibility and blooming on the gradient sequence in this patient with familial cavernomas. So the differential when you see multiple areas of susceptibility, we've talked about amyloid, angiopathy, hypertension. Now you can add cavernomas and also remember in the setting of trauma, shear injury. So cavernous malformations are discrete collections of sinusoids or caverns. They're really vascular hematomas. There's no normal intervening brain tissue. And you have recurrent intralesional hemorrhage, which is responsible for the imaging characteristics that we see. 
The risk of intraparenchymal hemorrhage varies depending on whether they're sporadic, which you see in 75% of the cases, or familial. So the familial cases have a higher risk for hemorrhage. The associated developmental venous anomaly can be a clue with the acute hemorrhage when you may not be able to see the underlying cavernous malformation. And you can see in this case a large developmental venous anomaly associated with a pontine cavernoma. On imaging on MRI, you see this black halo or complete hemosiderin ring, which is one way to distinguish it from hemorrhagic metastases, which often don't have a complete hemosiderin ring. You see this popcorn-like T2 hyperintensity centrally, and on T1 you see hyper and hypo-intense locules from repeated hemorrhage. Minimal or no enhancement, you can see the associated developmental venous anomaly. On CT, greater than 50% of these are going to calcify, so look like our case. And when they haven't bled, you shouldn't really see mass effect. So what about this case? So here's an axial T2 and an axial post-contrast. No T2 abnormality, but on the post-contrast, you see this faint brush-like enhancement in the pons. And this is classic for a capillary telangiectasia. These are commonly in the brainstem and associated with radiation. Usually you don't have T2, but in larger lesions you can have T2 abnormality. When you do a gradient sequence, you're going to see susceptibility in the brainstem. These are don't touch lesions. So here's our fourth unknown case, a 15-year-old who presents with headache and right homominous hemianopsia. Well, first you see the cause of his homominous hemianopsia. He has a lesion here in the left occipital lobe, a hemorrhage, so parenchymal hemorrhage in a child. So what is your differential? Again, you're looking for underlying lesion. Is there underlying vascular abnormality, AVM or cavernoma, underlying tumor, remember dural venous sinus thrombosis. And here's the CT angiogram where you see this abnormal cluster of vessels and the conventional angiogram. And when you're looking, if you get shown a conventional angiogram on your boards, which, is, which would be rare, but first start off with the injection and the, pro, the projection that you're looking at. So this is an injection of the internal carotid artery, and this is a lateral projection. And so you're seeing here, you're seeing your PCOM filling out your PCA. So there's PCA supply. And here are your MCA branches, so there's MCA supply. So that's what you want to tell the clinicians. When you see an AVM, you want to know what's the primary arterial supply, the venous drainage, is it an eloquent location, what is the size, are there any associated aneurysms, and you can see here a small intranidal aneurysm. And these are important for treatment planning and prognosis, and to assign the Spetzler-Martin grading, which is based on the size of the AVM, whether or not it's an eloquent brain, and the pattern of venous drainage. And you can see an AVM here coming off the left, coming off the MCA branches, and you can see superficial drainage up to the superior sagittal sinus. So the treatment, if these are amenable to resection, then resection is the first line choice. Gamma knife can be used if they're not amenable to resection, if they're less than three centimeters, and embolization is often used as an adjunctive treatment preoperatively. Okay, so ours was a Spetzler-Martin grade two. You can see highlighted in green are the MCA branches, the PCA branches highlighted in blue, and here's your intranidal, small intranidal aneurysm. So the classic AVM has AV shunting and no intervening capillary bed. So the nidus itself has little to no brain tissue. These are usually sporadic and solitary, but you can have congenital cases, 2% that are multiple and syndromic, so Osler, Weber, Rinda, or hered hereditary hemat hemorrhagic telangiectasias. The bleeding risk really varies, and you can suggest increased bleeding risk when you see both feeding artery or nidal aneurysms, venous outflow stenosis, deep location in the brain, or deep venous drainage, and a smaller nidus, which seems counterintuitive. On imaging, on CT, you may see calcification in 25 to 30 percent, these isodense or hyperdense vessels, and then the bag of worms appearance on MRI. Notice that you don't usually see surrounding T2 or mass effect, but you can in some cases see surrounding T2 signal from gliosis. So in summary, the vascular malformations, there are those with a shunt. Remember, AVMs are a congenital vascular malformation. Dural arteriovenous fistulas also have a shunt but are usually acquired and then the no-shunt lesions. And I've also highlighted in yellow those that carry a risk of hemorrhage, and in white, those that do not. Okay, so this is unknown number five. Here's a 40-year-old pre-op. So what is this procedure? Well, this is a lateral, this is a frontal and lateral projection from an ECA injection. So what's the anatomy that we're seeing? This vessel that's feeding it is the middle meningeal artery, and you can see that that comes off of the internal maxillary artery. So this is a hypervascular mass, and this is a patient with a meningioma that's undergoing preoperative embolization. This is the mother-in-law sign on angiography, comes early and stays late. 
So the next case is a seven-year-old female with acute onset of headache. So on the non-contrast CT, you see that the patient has a small intraparenchymal hematoma in the medial temporal lobe, but also subarachnoid hemorrhage in the left greater than right sylvian fissures and hydrocephalus. So in this case, especially when there's no history of trauma, you're thinking of aneurysm and you want to order a CTA. And here's the CTA in that patient. So what is the diagnosis here? Well, this is a PCOM aneurysm. And you can see there's your superclinoid internal carotid artery, and there's your posterior communicating artery, a branch of the superclinoid internal carotid artery, and a PCOM aneurysm right at the origin. Here's your conventional angiogram. You can see on the AP view, so the frontal projection of a left internal carotid artery injection, you can see the aneurysm, but not as well as you can see it on the lateral. So let's review a little bit of a normal anatomy on the conventional angiogram. So here's your superclinoid internal carotid artery. And remember that your PCOM, which feeds your PCA branches, is a branch of the superclinoid. The superclinoid comes up to the carotid T, and the terminal branches are the ACA and MCA. And then on the lateral projection, we can see the petrous internal carotid, we can see the cavernous coming up to the ophthalmic, and then the supraclinoid. Remember that the ophthalmic is a proximal branch of your supraclinoid, so it can help differentiate between cavernous and supraclinoid. And then again, here's your PCOM filling out PCA branches in blue, and your ACA and MCA. So this is the same patient who develops aphasia 10 days post-clipping. So now on the non-contrast CT, you say that the, see that the patients had an EVD in place, so oftentimes these patients will develop hydrocephalus, as we saw. And, but now the patient has wedge-shaped areas of hypodensity. So what is your primary concern here, and what do you want to see next? Well, the primary concern is vasospasm, and these are infarcts related to vasospasm, and you want to look at a CT angiogram. And when you see the CT angiogram, you see diffuse caliber narrowing involving the M1s and A1s in this patient with vasospasm. What you really want to see in this case is a pretreatment CTA, or if you're looking at an angio, you want to see the pretreatment angio. And in this case, when you compare the angiogram at the time of vasospasm to the pretreatment, you can see really severe diffuse narrowing involving the A1 and M1 segments compared to the preoperative study. And you can see narrowing involving the right PCA, the basilar artery, and vertebral artery, really diffuse vasospasm in the posterior circulation also. So dealing with aneurysms and subarachnoid hemorrhage, when you see subarachnoid hemorrhage that's non-traumatic, also if it's in a pattern in the basilar cisterns, order the CTA to find the aneurysm. Look for the second and third aneurysms. When you have a patient coming in with a third nerve palsy, especially if it's involving the pupil, it's a PCOM aneurysm until proven otherwise. Conventional four-vessel angiograms are the way that we evaluate these, and so you should know your basic ICA anatomy that we've discussed. And on follow-up scans, look out for these complications. So I, I included this in your syllabus, which is just um, looking at the typical distribution of congenital aneurysms. So what are the risk factors? So here's unknown case number seven. You can see that this is an injection of the common carotid artery. So we're seeing the cervical internal carotid artery. And of course, here's your external carotid artery. Remember, we'll be branching in the neck, whereas the internal carotid artery will not. And you can see multiple areas of beating and dil dilatation. And this is fibromuscular dysplasia. And this is a risk factor for intracranial aneurysms. And when you look closely here, you see that the patient does have a an superclinoid intracranial aneurysm. So what other risk factors? Here's another risk factor, and you can see on the uh, axial T2-weighted sequence, you can see a vessel extending from the cavernous carotid back to the basilar artery. And here, on the conventional frontal injection of the right internal carotid artery, you can see filling of the basilar artery and PCAs in this patient with a persistent trigeminal artery. So the differential here is really a big fetal PCA. Remember, fetal PCA is going to come off the superclinoid internal carotid artery, whereas this abnormality comes off the cavernous internal carotid artery a connection to the basilar artery. So here's your eighth unknown case. This is a 77-year-old that came in with cranial nerve palsies. All of these nerves are within the cavernous sinus, and you can see a very large, rounded, hyperdense mass associated with the cavernous sinus on the right. And if you look closely, there is a smaller mass associated with cavernous sinus on the left. And these are hyperdense and very rounded, so while you may be tempted to think of meningioma, whenever you see this very rounded mass, especially if you have peripheral calcifications, always be thinking of giant cavernous aneurysms. And that's what you're seeing in this case, two giant cavernous carotid aneurysms. So here's a 56-year-old with word-finding difficulty in dysmetria. 
So multiple areas of hypodensity involving the right caudate head, involving the right thalamus, also the left thalamus, and involving the left temporal lobe. And if you think back to what we talked about earlier, when you have bilateral thalamic abnormality, one thing that you want to be thinking of is internal cerebral vein or deep venous sinus thrombosis. And this is a subtle case in the CT, but if you look at the CT, these internal cerebral veins are way too dense. Look at your straight sinus here. I can't go back, but the straight sinus is also very dense. So if you look at the coronal flare and the coronal post contrast, you can see on the flare images the abnormality that we saw in the temporal lobe and also in the cerebellum. Note that the flow void on the flare actually looks like it's present, which is a fake out on this flare for an, in the setting of an acute thrombus. And then you see on the post contrast a filling defect in this patient with sinus thrombosis. You can see on the diffusion, it's not really reduced on diffusion, so not typical for arterial or hypoxic ischemic injury. This patient went on to get an MRV. So here's the MRV, and oftentimes what's missing is the hardest thing to really see. So in this case, you see some of the normal anatomy. This is a superior sagittal sinus, your transverse sinus, your sigmoid sinus, and your IJ. But what you're missing is really your entire deep venous system. And there's your vein of Trollard here coming off the superior sagittal sinus. So you can see that you're missing your straight sinus, you're missing your inferior sagittal sinus, your internal cerebral veins, and your vein of Galen in this patient that has deep venous sinus thrombosis. And this is the vein of LeBay that drains into the transverse sinus. So dural sinus thrombosis, on CT you'll see this hyperdense and expanded sinus, and on post-contrast images you may see the empty delta sign. On MRI you'll lose the flow void, as you can see on this axial T2 you've lost your normal flow void. Look out for the pitfall when acute dural sinus thrombosis. Also when you're doing time of flight, look out for the pitfall when you see T1 shortening, mimicking flow-related enhancement. The patterns of venous ischemia, so when it's a superior sagittal sinus, it's often parasagittal. When it's a transverse sinus, you often have abnormality in the temporal lobe. And the deep sinuses, look at for bithalamic abnormality. And it's often overlooked, so be thinking of this one. Here's another case, and you can see fiducial markers on this patient that's on the way to the operating room for biopsy of these multiple areas of mass-like T2 signal. But when you look closely, you can see that this phloboid is gone in the superior sagittal sinus. And I can tell you that these were enhancing and looking very mass-like. And this was dural sinus thrombosis. So venous hypertension can be reversible, so another reason that this is a do not miss diagnosis. Venous infarct, it's often the subcortical white matter. It won't follow an arterial distribution. It's often hemorrhagic. Diffusion can or cannot be reduced, but it's usually not reduced like an arterial infarct. And it can be mass-like and mimic neoplasms. So this is really key. So here's your 10th unknown, a four-year-old with progressive loss of milestones. So axial post-contrast and your T2. You can see on this post-contrast what looks like leptomeningeal enhancement over the entire left cerebral hemisphere. And if you look in the basal ganglia, you see these multiple enhancing dots. And these are collateral vessels. And you can see multiple small and abnormal flow voids within the uh, supracellar cistern here. And this is the cross-sectional imaging appearance of Moya Moya. So you can see on the MRA, you can see occlusion of the supraclinoid. And again, these multiple enhancing dots which are the lenticular striate collaterals of Moya Moya. So Moya Moya is an idiopathic progressive arteriopathy of childhood, where you have occlusion mainly in the anterior circulation. But you can have secondary Moya Moya in sickle cell, neurofibromatosis, radiation, atherosclerosis, and we see a lot of drug use at the, our county hospital mimicking this. The classic angiographic appearance is this puff of smoke, the cloud-like lenticular striate collaterals. You can see this injection of the left internal carotid artery with occlusion, and then these lenticular striate collaterals filling out the MCA branches. In pediatric patients, we normally see ischemia, and in adult patients, hemorrhage. And here's our last unknown case. This is a 52-year-old female with proptosis and vision loss. So on the coronal T1 weighted, here you can see your superior ophthalmic vein, which is enlarged. You can also see your extraocular muscles are enlarged. Same thing on your axial T2, enlargement of your extraocular muscles, retrobulbar stranding. And when you look again, here's your superior ophthalmic vein again, which is enlarged. On the coronal post-contrast, 
you see bowing and asymmetric enlargement of that cavernous sinus. And these are the classic cross-sectional imaging features for a CC fistula. And now when you look on your conventional angiogram, this is an injection of the left internal carotid artery, and you can see early filling out into the cavernous sinus. And on the lateral projection, you can see this early filling into the cavernous sinus, draining out the superior ophthalmic vein, and draining down into the inferior petrosal sinus. And this is a carotid cavernous fistula. Carotid cavernous fistulas of patients can present with visual findings, loss of vision. Um, they can also present with findings in, related to the cavernous sinus. Classical cross-sectional imaging features are those that we've seen, dilated superior ophthalmic vein, enlarged ocular muscles, retrobulbar stranding, and a bowed cavernous sinus. Cavernous carotid fistulas can be indirect, which are normally low flow. They're meningeal branches. These are dural arteriovenous fistulas. These spontaneous lesions can be observed if they're asymptomatic. Whereas direct CC fistulas, which are also often the sequela of trauma or aneurysm rupture, they usually need more uh, immediate treatment. And here's an example of a direct CC fistula. You can see from the frontal and lateral projection this large area of uh, contrast extravasation into the cavernous sinus, out the superior ophthalmic vein and inferior petrosal sinus. So in summary for your boards, you're not as likely to get shown a conventional angiogram, so don't worry too much with that anatomy. Know the differential diagnosis for intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Understand the presentation for aneurysm dissection and thrombosis that we've discussed. And your imaging strategies, what you're going to suggest next. Know your major ICA and ECA branches. And know the major dural sinuses and the many faces of dural sinus thrombosis. So keep this one in mind for any intraparenchymal hemorrhage. And know the congenital vascular malformations that we discussed.